Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art and Talk. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Leslie Sue, the host for Art and Talk. If you've been watching Art and Talk for a while, you know Art and Talk is all about meeting artists and being inspired. We embrace all the arts, from the traditional arts to the spiritual arts. And we aim to dive into the heart and mind of each guest artist so that we can gain a wider perspective of their art, their message, and their process. All right, so and if you're new to us, welcome. We're gonna be continuing today to bring you another artist from the Art Acquisitions Exhibit, Large and Small, which is currently on view at the Cultural Council for Palm Beach County in Lake Worth Beach, Florida. And our guest today is an award-winning photographer and his passion is in street art photography. So we'll be looking at some of his images and street art photos, as well as some of his portraits, and of course, diving into his journey as well. All right, so again, thank you for being with us. I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Philip Mark Paritsky. Hi, thank Philip, you. welcome. Hi, how are you, Liz? Good, it's good to see you again. Same here, same here. Yeah. All right, so, you know, as I was looking over your bio, Philip, you have such a great story of how you received your first camera at 11 from your father. And uh, my grandfather. It was your grandfather. Papa, yeah, my papa is my grandfather. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, wow, okay. And yeah. can you share that with us and some of your sure. recollections sure. of what that was like to get your first camera? I was in sixth grade and I wanted a camera. And so... <laughs> whatever the situation was, couldn't get one. My papa, my grandfather used to smoke Chesterfield cigarettes. And in, in the package or in the cellophane, there were coupons like the old S&H green stamps, if anyone remembers that. And he was able to save up enough. Unfortunately, he had to smoke too much to do it. But, uh, <laughs> and he got me my first camera, which was a Kodak Hawkeye. I actually have it, which is kind of neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so once and, you um, yeah. I took it and I had a sixth grade field trip to Lincoln Center. I was living in New York City at the time. And it's, I have the actual snapshot from that. It's in a frame at home. And we had, remember in the old days, they used to put the date on it. <laughs> so I actually have that, you know. I kept it, you know, all my beginning stuff with that camera I have right before the pandemic and I reshot it. And it's honestly, other than the fact that the original was black and white and the new one is in color, there's not that much difference. I could see from that very first picture the direction that I ended up doing, my, the style of architectural photography, what have you. So it's fun, it's great, it's a great memory. So this is such a great story. And so it almost sounds like you came full circle with going back there and actually photographing it and seeing that that was really um, an early style of yours that you really fell in love with, with architecture. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, well, before I started taking pictures, now I started at 11, but prior to that, I was designing houses or floor plans with graph paper and pencil. So I was always aware of design and composition and straight lines and how they meet and intersect and how they work together. And then I took that into just naturally without, I wasn't aware of what I was doing. I was 11, you know, but it just bled into it. And that's how I've been shooting ever since. I don't want to say for how many years, but it was. And I would love to also touch upon Philip, um, you have been photographing the East Coast of America for over five decades. Can you share some highlights of that experience? Oh, sure. I mean, up until about 25 years ago, it was primarily New York City because of my age. My parents retired, moved down to Florida, and I draw, I've been driving there for 25 years. And there are lots of pictures on my website that are taken while traveling that I would never normally have gotten. So I, it's why I always drive, I very rarely fly down. And let's move into your 
formal education, you have quite quite a lot of um, education yeah. going on in the arts, but also in business as well. Yes. Well, I started out at a local community college right after high school, not knowing what I wanted to do. And I was already, I, my high school happened to have two photography teachers, which is very unusual, even from back then. And so I was studying in high school. Didn't occur to me, you can go to college for this. I don't know why nobody mentioned it to me, but it wasn't said. And I was reading a photography magazine, I guess popular photography, and there was an article about the Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT. I said, okay, I'll apply. I applied, got in. You know? And then I went from, that was a two year program. And I wanted a bachelor's, just have a bachelor's to fall back on. So I went to School of Visual Arts, also in Manhattan, got my BFA. Was a working photographer in you know commercial catalog types of things. And, um, got married and after my last shoot i decided i don't want to do this anymore i didn't like the idea of being told what to shoot how to shoot it because an art director would design the ad the client would approve it i'd have to shoot it or replicate it as drawn and i didn't want to do that i want the rest. i had to have the freedom I said, well, what am I going to do? So I started working with the photographer's wife, who was the bookkeeper, the math, whatever, even though accounting's not math, it's arithmetic. And so she was showing me debits, credits, what have you. And I said, I could do that. So then I decided to go back to school for accounting. And so I went to Queens College in New York, got my accounting degree, graduated, got a job as a, uh, just in public accounting. Then I got a job as a moved away to get a job as a controller and then became chief financial officer for, for a couple of different companies. I was working in Manhattan. It was during 9-11. And I said, I'm not, I was living in Pennsylvania. So I was commuting, which, I, which was fine. But I just, I'm not going back to Manhattan for a while. So I just kind of like retired. And um, I, in late in 2016, now I haven't taken pictures in a long time. Late in 2016, I'm driving to my daughter's house up in New Hampshire, and I stopped and took a picture with my iPhone. And I said, I think I can still do this. And I've been shooting nonstop ever since. I mean, a few thousand pictures since the end of 2016. And that's pretty much what I do. That's all I do now. Mm -hmm. I think this would be a great moment, Philip. Let's pull up some of your images and let's how you count them. In just a moment, let me get those up. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I. That's part of a series that's in the cultural center in Palm Beach, mm -hmm. but it's like what I like to call my pandemic pictures. Because everything was on lockdown, nobody was home, everybody was online. And so I was, people I was in conversations with, I would screenshot. And then do my little magic and editing and what have you. And um, so that's what I did for the, for the most of the past two years, 18 months because of the pandemic. Yes. I don't, I'm not that interested in pursuing that unless somebody wants me to but it's something I think I do okay. And um, cultural center seemed to like it. I liked it, you know, but it's not my main thing to do. Right, right. So this was really birthed out of the pandemic and just yes. to keep your photography alive and you ended up with the you know, portrait. Yes. Because mm -hmm. I couldn't, there was nowhere to really go where I could do street photography. There's nobody on the streets. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. So I started doing this. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit about um, moving into the portraits, which you were saying, you know, is really not your thing, but it was just to kind of, you know, do some photography given the circumstances. So can you talk to us a little bit about the composition design, you know, the beautiful color? Yeah, well, when you see some other images, you'll see color. I'm basically a color photographer. Unless I really feel the shot calls to be in black and white. 
And so uh, my colors are always, you know, bright, bold, vibrant colors are something I'm always doing. Now, I forgot which pictures I sent you or that you have access to. But even when I was pre-digital, when I was shooting on Kodachrome, I got these colors and these kind of exposures and what have you. So it's not any different or something new for me. And composition, I learned when I was at FIT, the big thing well, was you were kind of photography and design major. So I learned design composition. We used to basically have styrofoam shapes and just set them up with a bare light bulb and just to learn how to design and compose an image properly. Mm -hmm. was, I remember the first day in art school, they said there are rules. Okay. They said, don't ever put anything in the center. Because then it'll look like a snapshot. Well, so I've done for more oh, for about the past 40 odd years of trying to put things in the center. And it, I, sometimes it works, sometimes no. But, you know, it's each individual shot. I look at every shot individually at the time. I don't try to, well, I did this last time, so I'm going to do that again. You know, mm -hmm. every shot I treat separate. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that way you keep it fresh and, and keep it right. at, at that specific use. Right. That's why I'm still occasionally doing these type of portraits. Like I did one last night. Mm -hmm. Just I don't want to get stuck into any kind of rut. I want to constantly be doing different things, different images, type of images. Mm -hmm. But I also can't really tell my mind, OK, see this way or see that way. It's what I happen to see at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Just in that moment, what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, and then expressing that through your photography. Yes, thank yeah. you. All right, so let's go to the next one. And this is- uh, That's also from that series. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm not looking to necessarily capture reality. I'm not a photojournalist, mm -hmm. you know? Although occasionally I do, but that's just very rarely. You know, I basically look as the original photograph that I took as a sketch for someone who paints or draws or something like that. And then I fill in. I mean, I have a lot of control over which colors I want to be there and where. I mean, it's still basically, it started out yellow, but I just added some other and edited some other and to get the image that I want to get. Mm -hmm. So, and again, this was the, during the pandemic, it was a screenshot. And then, as you said, you kind of worked up your magic and your strong color. Right. right. You know, crop out the unnecessary things. I totally look at every, when it's a screenshot, I'm totally free to edit as I please. It's not like when I do a street shot, I want it to be what I see in the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, I can tell when I do before I take the screenshot, I can see there's a possible image there. I'm certainly not saying every single one I do. I delete as many as I keep, but I'm not asking anybody to pose for me a certain way. Yeah, I try to capture them just in their natural position that they happen to be in at the moment. If I think there's a potential for a shot there, then I, I'll, I'll just keep snapping the screenshots one after another if I'm like in the range. If I see something I totally don't like, I'll just move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. So there's no direction from your part in terms of no. posing or, or moving or this and that. It's what you see, and if, and if you resonate with it, you go with it. Right. Now, as far as portraits go, I've always liked doing portraits, like in a studio in a controlled situation, and I generally prefer them in black and white. Mm. So I have some of those, also some screenshots, but I have old stuff, old work that's in you know black and white studio. Mm -hmm. And I can replicate that. You, would, so you wouldn't know that I wasn't in the studio. Mm -hmm. The world was my studio. How's that? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to a some street art photography. Okay. Perfect. This is exactly what I mean. It's the same type of colors. Um, this was shot on 125th Street in Harlem. If anybody knows New York, in the right corner by that yellow stripe, you can see a little globe that's yellow and green. That's the end. The, that's the entrance. You can see some people starting to walk downstairs to the subway. 
The other people were just milling around the street. And the original shop, it was on such a dull day, it was literally almost black and white. It was just all shades of gray. Mm -hmm. And um, the red was there. I just was able to modify it to be the way I wanted. I mean, the wall was red, the wall was green, but it didn't look anything like this. Mm -hmm. And then with the way I edit, it's just, you can see the people aren't crisp. Somebody looks like a shadow getting ready to walk down the steps. I literally took this from my car window, which I do a lot of times. Yeah. Wow, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm literally on 125th Street waiting for the light to turn green. <laughs> you know, right. No to pull over. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. So that's really um, all about you in the moment photography. You're at, the, you're at the light, you see this, you like it, right. the photo. Right. I have no intent when I'm out on a specific picture. The only time that happens is if I see something and I don't have the ability to stop, I'll quickly write down where it is mm -hmm. and go back and try to capture it then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, Philip, is there a certain message um, with your street art photography? We know how much you love color and um, you know this whole sense of design and movement. Um, you, and you were saying it was, you know, the, it was a kind of like, sounds like a typical kind of New York day. It had some of that, you know, grayness, a very, you know, urban kind of feel. So really this level of color and creativity, is, is there a certain like message that you're trying to convey to your street art photography? No, because this is actually one of the rare street art pieces that has people in it. Mm -hmm. I generally, because, I always have to be in the position where I can go back and reshoot if I don't like the end result, because I started out with film. So you'd send it out to the lab, wait a week. And if it involved people, they're not gonna be there waiting for me. So it's generally without people. There are a few like this that has people in it. Mm -hmm. And since it's digital, I see it right away. Mm -hmm. I don't have to wait for the film to come back from the lab to see if I got the image I want. Right. I mean, and if the light turned green and I wasn't happy, I would have put my flashes on and kept taking the pictures till I got what I liked. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead to the next one, Philip. Okay. Another one with, okay, you see part of a person, which I'm very happy about because I like the fact that it's all red, white, blue, and he has a green hat on or a scarf on his head. And um, this is actually the build, the back of the building across the street from the cultural center of Palm Beach. That's now the whole building is all white. And I happened to be at the gallery that day and I was parked in the back, this building and they were in the process of painting the whole building white. Now, if anybody has ever heard of the photographer, Jay Mizell, he's like a big hero of mine. I don't try to copy him. My style is similar to his. So I'm always thinking after the fact, oh, this looks like a Jay Mizell, how interesting, yeah. Well, I've had the good fortune to meet once when I was in college. It turned out my girlfriend at the time, her mother grew up in Brooklyn with Jay Mizell. And so she called and arranged meetings. I went down to his studio. Bank. He actually had a bank building because he was a street photographer. He didn't really need a studio, but he bought a uh, old bank, and all his work was stored in the vault. Mm -hmm. What's amazing? Yeah, an amazing experience, and you, you know, get to meet someone that you know, like you know that you're emulating and, and so influenced and inspired by his work, and to have that opportunity to oh, actually it, was, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Wow. And this is a fairly recent picture too, and it's still very much still shoot. I hope, I hope you have an older picture on there just so we can have as a comparison. I'm not sure what you have. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's continue on. We have a couple more. Okay. Okay, this is one of my travels up and down the East Coast of America. This was in Savannah, Georgia. On the way to, I stopped in Savannah for dinner on the way to Florida. And the restaurant is a little more to the left, but I just, this is my, one of the things where don't, where they don't tell me not to put things in the center. 
you know, because I think this works pretty well in the center. Even though it's really, if you cover up half of it, it's the two completely different images. The left half from my angle is, it's pretty desolate. There's nothing in the windows except old curtains. And the other side is an active business. There's even a red bench on the other side under by the store. The other one has nothing. So I, this picture, this is my, literally my all time favorite. Mm -hmm. And has won the most you know, contests and awards and what have you. Mm -hmm. And as far as the colors go with those strong reds and blues, were some of those um, there within the actual environment that you enhanced up or is it kind of similar to the street or uh, first one that we looked at where- Well, you know? I'm hoping you have something that I shot on Kodachrome because these are the colors I would get on film that I couldn't edit. I would just be able to get these colors by bracketing my exposure. So. I can, I can do that while I shoot with my phone, but I don't need to. I can turn, you know, I can just shoot and not worry about manual settings while I'm shooting. Like I said, a lot of times I'm shooting directly from my car at a red light and I don't have the time to do F-stops and shutter speeds, mm -hmm. you know? So I just do it after the fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the, the pavement in front of everything is natural color pavement. So like by enhancing the reds and the blues, it didn't alter that. So it looks pretty natural. In my, in my eye anyway, it looks very natural. Like I said, everything starts out to me as a sketch and then I just fill in the blank, you know, fill in the lines how I want them to be. Right, right. You have that sketch as a basis or foundation. And then yes. Have, you work it up with different layers according to your artistic vision in your view. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, I think we have one more, Philip. No, I think that was actually it. Yeah, I think I only seen four. Yes. Yeah, we're back. But if anybody, I mean, if I can, if I can self promote, I mean, there's, I have my website mm -hmm. and that's um, sjgallery.org, O-R-G. Because I used to literally have a physical gallery mm -hmm. and it was a nonprofit. It was for, besides myself, other artists of all different levels, including a local high school student's work. And I didn't get anything, except if I sold mine. I kept, I think it was 5% for the gallery, just to cover some overhead. And the rest all went to the artist. Now, COVID kind of shut, made me shut that down and what didn't make sense to keep it open. So I closed that, but that's why the, uh, it's a .org, I didn't have to change it. Right, right. Well, it sounds like at the time uh, when you had it going on, you know, and a great opportunity for artists to learn and grow and exhibit their work and have that, you know, kind of nurturing space. And then also because of my financial and accounting background, I knew how to get the 501c3 nonprofit status from the IRS. I knew right. how to fill out forms and, you know, right. I was able to end plus manage the business. Right. You know, bookkeeping of that. So I was able to combine everything into, in that job. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering also with your um, formal education in the art, and then of course we're talking about in, in business as well, um, you see that play out in your individual photography as well? Now we were thinking about the gallery, but what about your individual work? Is there kind of an interplay going on? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I've always been like a logical, you know, straightforward, and that shows in my work. The lines are generally pretty straight. I'm a stickler for that. I mean, it's, I don't want anything that's crooked, things like, very rarely do I shoot something that's not straight on and everything is perfectly lined up. And it's a little bit of OCD in there. You know, I like things that way. So that's why I was able to transition into accounting and finance because everything has to be such and such a way. And my photographs are just like that. Mm -hmm. But it also has, and we've been discussing 
fill up that spontaneous element because you're so in the moment as a photographer. We know the areas that you, you gravitate towards with your eye, with the architecture, with the lines, with the design, kind of keeping it clean, but yet you're just so like in the moment. You see it and you're right there. Yes. Yeah, I don't go out looking. What can I photograph today? Mm -hmm. I could be out and not see anything. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the one of the ways I get out and take these pictures is for, as a part time job. I drive for Uber, so I don't. So it takes me all over the place, and I'll see I'll see things that I normally wouldn't have seen just staying in my local area. So, a lot of the work is done while Ubering. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying I shoot a lot right from the car window. Or if I can't shoot it at that moment, mm -hmm. since there are usually no people in it, I'll write down the location mm -hmm. and go back to it. Right, right. There's and hopefully there's still a shot. Yeah. Right, right. I love it. And that's just like the, the perfect kind of part-time job because you're, you're moving about and you're going to be seeing something if you do. Right. I know if I was driving around myself, I'd end up like in the same areas frequently, you know? Mm -hmm. But this way I'm forced to go to areas that I've never seen before and what have you. Right. So it's great, it's great. Right, yes. And can you tap us into, Philip, what is it that you see that strikes you? Like, you know, we know it's that internal something, we know some of the areas that you gravitate with, but what, what is it you're like, ah, oh, that's it. Usually it's the composition of what I see from my eye. Mm -hmm. like I, I, I'm not concerned with the color as much, although I like to shoot a lot of red, if you haven't noticed. Um, but it's just the way things line up. And it just, I, it just does, it just happens. I just, I can't tell when I'm, I don't know in advance when I'm gonna see something, obviously. I just, oh, there's that, and quickly shoot it. Especially if I'm driving. <laughs> right, right, I, I love that. I love the whole way that you approach your photography and, and what your eye sees. Can you tap us into anything, Philip, about your editing process that you'd like to share? Yes. Originally, when I started doing this, even professionally, and when I was in school, I was shooting Kodachrome. Mm -hmm. There was no editing. Because you get you send your film out a week or 10 days later, you get it back. The slide is in a little cardboard frame. So there was no cropping, no adjustments of any kind. I've done more since, since I'm shooting with digitally. So like if I'm shooting from my call window, I can't get it composed exactly as I want at the time. So then I will crop. But I've always, until digital, I've always was against crop. Even in with black and white in the dark room. It's like, if I didn't get it right, I'll go back and redo it. Now it's pretty much, I don't have a choice. Unless I'm totally on my own, Let's say I go back to shoot something I saw like the day before because I was driving and couldn't stop. Then I'll get out of the car and compose it the way I wanted to. So I don't have to edit the design. And the color, I, all my pictures, street pictures basically have the same color, whether it was Kodachrome or now digital. It's just like those deep reds, like from those benches. I just like it to pop. Mm -hmm. Love those most, of the time, most of the time there are times i go with just subtle pastels it all depends upon what each what i see the potential for each individual picture mm -hmm. so that's interesting so that the color palette does shift based on that moment based on whatever right. mm -hmm. or i mean what i see in real life i'm hoping is the right colors <laughs> and sometimes i'll see it as a black and white i'll just see it and I know it's, it's going to look okay in color, but I think it's going to look pretty decent in black and white. Because mm -hmm. yes. everything is shot in color digitally. Mm -hmm. I don't turn it on and off. And I just convert it to black and white mm -hmm. in case I was wrong. <laughs> That's an interesting process. And, and I'm so glad that you're sharing this with us, Philip. I'm wondering if we could move um, a little bit up to speed because I know as of this month of May, um, you signed the gallery. I'm wondering if you'd like to share anything about that. The Agora Gallery is a um, art gallery in the art district of Chelsea in Manhattan. 
I had an exhibit there through Guru Shots, which is an online photography thing with about half a million people around the, around the world, a part of this. And um, they sponsor contests or uh, ex exhibitions and what have you. And so it was a black and white photographer of the year. I was lucky enough to get four pieces in. I was told that the most that people had were two. So I was thrilled. And I heard it was also a lot of National Geographic photographers. So I'm boasting a little bit right now. But um, so uh, when I got them, got there, I decided, let me talk to them. And um, I submitted a portfolio. They accepted it. I'm not live yet online. I will have my own website very soon with them. Right now, we're in the process of picking and choosing which ones. They don't put my whole website up. They have their own website with 16 images. And they're all going to be the architectural pictures. So keep it as a theme. And they'll be, they'll be marketing. That's what I'm paying them for. They'll be doing all the marketing and selling and printing. I don't have to do anything except say, okay. <laughs> you know, which I like. I also have something new you don't know about. There's a clothing manufacturer from Canada. I have a terrible French accent called uh, Les Galeristi. And they manufacture women's clothing, casual wear, and some accessories. And all their prints, the fabrics, are made from original artwork of people. So not that everything's one of a kind because you can mass produce it, but it's not like a typical fabric pattern that you would see in retail. So that site is up and running. Those are some exciting new developments. Oh, it's, been a, it's been a very busy year. Yes. Yeah. Very busy. I mean, through Guru Shots and the Cultural Center and a local art league in my hometown, I've already booked 26 shows this year. Fantastic. Yeah, and tomorrow I fly down to Florida. I don't even know if I said this. But anyway, um, the city of Boynton Beach in Florida asked me to be part of an exhibit they're putting together of all their city parks. So I'm flying down tomorrow night and there's 33 parks. So I should get some, they only want five images. So out of 33 parks, I should be able to get five images. Mm -hmm. And they'll be for sale. And um, there's also a jury that decides, you know, best in show, what have you. But I'm, it was something I've never done. Nobody's ever given me an assignment to shoot something specific, like the park, but I still have the total freedom to shoot what I want. Right. As opposed to commercial photography, I got to shoot this shoe, you know? Right. You know, at least I can still pick what I want to shoot. I'm just told where to shoot it. Mm -hmm. So I've never had that experience. That's the main reason I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's really branching out because you know that you have a specific things to, to photograph within the parks. I mean, you're not told you have to photograph this or that, but you are specifically going to photograph. Right. So they did say, please take pictures of the basketball courts. It's like whatever. Once I'm in the park, I'm free to do whatever I want. Or even from the outside of the park, I'm free to do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. going to be exciting. And, um, I'd love to see what you're going to create from this experience. And I love that you're kind of like venturing out because I can see, you know, it's, it's a whole different kind of approach to things um, and, you know, bringing your skill and your talent and, and your eye to it. Yeah, I've never done this. I've never had an assignment like this before. It's either I was told exactly what to shoot and how to shoot it or total freedom, whatever I see and I, that I want to take a picture of. Right. So here I'm kind of in, not pigeonholed, but I have to just take it in the, at the park. Right. Yeah. I also have to keep track of which park I'm in because they want to know which, where the pic, there's 33 parks and they want to know where the picture came from, which park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'm just imagining you're going to walk into these parks, just kind of completely open and just what you see is what you yes. have going to attract you and then you're there. And it, it's just this beautiful kind of approach that you have. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Something new. I, I, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like it doesn't, you never know when something new is going to come up. Yes. Yes. I'm wondering, Philip, um, we still have a moment or so before we close out. 
would you be kind enough to offer some advice to any photographers that might be watching at you know various skill levels? What would you um, advise them? Um, the main thing I always tell other people when they ask, how can I take better? Just get closer. I mean, if you look, people, if you look at their pictures that are trying to do this, it's like, even if you take family pictures, probably about 50% of the, of the image itself is nothing. It's just space around where everybody is standing. So if you want to take pictures of people that you know and love, take a picture of them. You know, you don't have to show a full body. Nobody, first of all, most people don't want their full body in a picture. <laughs> and um, just see, get the faces, go close. Not too close, you don't want to be distorted. And that's the other beauty of editing now with digital, because you can stand back and not get like big noses because they're distorted because you're too close and crop out the unnecessary part of the picture. That's what I've told everyone that I've taught photography to just get closer to the subject. You can always back up, you know? Yes, yes, I love it. It also, excuse me, it also puts you closer and more in touch with what you're doing. You're not doing everything from a distance. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't think I've ever used a zoom lens or anything like that. If I can't get close enough, then it's, why am I taking it? You know, I have, I, there's no connection at all mm -hmm. yeah. for me, people. Right. You know. right. And what about Philip, um, someone who might be watching this, who also has a love of street art photography. How would you advise them, Philip? Hmm. It, once again, get closer to what you want to capture. I have one black and white on my website that I would consider real street photography, what everybody would consider street photography. And everything is there in the image that I want. There's nothing there, I wish that wasn't there or this wasn't there. And it's hard to do that when you're just photographing in the street, especially with people, there's, there's lights and whatever in the way, power lines. Try to frame it in the camera. Because just being on top of the subject, as close as you can be, makes you more in touch with the subject you're photographing. Mm -hmm. You're not just like with the zoom lens, taking a picture of a wild animal that's half a mile away, so to speak, you know? There's no connection between you and the subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's about that connection for getting closer. Yes. Yeah, that's the main thing I tell everyone. Mm -hmm. The rest is I can't tell people how to shoot because everyone's gonna have their own style. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I shoot pretty much face on, as you can see from all these pictures, whether it's a portrait or a street shot. I'm, my camera's not angled, my camera's straight. And that's just the way I prefer to take pictures. Very rare do I have one that's taken at an angle. Because mm -hmm. that's another way that I can get close to my subject. Because mm -hmm. generally, if you're at an angle, that means you're not really on top of it. I also have a unique feature in the app I use. Because I don't use the camera app that came with the camera. There's another app that I use. And what it does is like, if you're shooting upward, like at a building, you normally you get the distortion, the building goes like this. Well, this straightens it out. So I have images that where it looks like I'm taking a picture of a tall building and there's no distortion. And I still shoot the three to two aspect, which is the same as 35 millimeter. Whether it's horizontal, vertical, except if occasionally I do a square, so people think I have a very good camera, <laughs> especially in the portraits. Yeah. Philip, we do need to wrap the show up. We like to leave our guests with the closing comments. Is there anything that you would like to close the show with? And if you can let us know how viewers can stay in touch with you, your website and um, any other social media comments. Sure, sure. Well, I want to thank everyone who's watching. I it wasn't too unpleasant. And uh, my gallery is sjgallery.org. Or if you have specific questions, my email is on the website. And it's also just sjart619 at gmail.com. 
and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have them. Very good. I love teaching, so that's. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Philip. For oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. And much success with um, all your endeavors with the Cultural Council. You know, maybe dabbing a little bit into portraits, as you said, you just did one last night, and then with this whole park photography. It's going to be fascinating to see what you come up with. So stay in touch with us and, and let us know how things are going. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. It was wonderful to connect with you. Thank Same you. Same here. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone for watching Art and Talk. As always, we appreciate the time you take to watch our artist videos and we hope you draw inspiration from them and enjoy them and find them in books as well. All right. So stay connected with Art and Talk on our YouTube channel and Facebook. Please subscribe, like, and share. And stay connected with us as we continue to bring a couple more artists from the art acquisition exhibit. All right, we'll talk soon on the next Autumn Talk. Until then, be well and be blessed.